Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. I hope you're staying cool today. We're we're a little warm out in the Pacific Northwest uh, for a few days or so. On that, those people back east, boy, really having some tough times. Hopefully, I, it's, it's my understanding, maybe you might have family out there and whatever, but but most of them are safe, uh, thank God, because uh, it was really tough on them. That's probably the first time they've ever had this kind of an extreme weather, if you will, in that, in, in that part of the country, New York and the like, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, what has been happening. But uh, hopefully they're doing fair and doing well, and uh, we wish them all well, okay? Well, now, today what we're going to do is that... Uh, uh, if you notice, I've got, I started off with a focus on a, on a publication here. It says uh, what every parent wants for their child and how to get it. You know, education is always, a good education has always been sort of a needle in a haystack. And people are constantly trying to figure out what is the correct formula, if you will, to get this done. And, I mean, we do all kinds of things. We, 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 to date, I mean, just bringing it right on up to date, uh, uh, we've got the various various schools. We got charter schools. We got private schools. We got public schools. I mean, on and on and on. It's gotten to be a business. Everybody's trying to figure out where's the needle in the haystack, and yet and still here we are in the 20th century. I mean, a very sophisticated society it's supposed to be at the top of the heap, if you will, of the chain, the food chain, the whole nine yard. But yet and still, uh, a number of our folks are really falling in the cracks. Our criminal justice system is growing. Repeatedly and basically that talks to education because in all due respect if you don't if you're not educated If you can't read and write and comprehend you're gonna fall in that criminal justice system and it's gotten to be a business So the thing is that what do we do? How did we get there? What do we do to get out of it? What do we do to communicate to us that we're all involved and that we're all responsible and you know, during those formative years for the new group that's coming up We've got to do something if you will to try to counter that situation. Okay, well now I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I've got, a, I've got a gentleman with me today that has been somewhat in the area like I've been in the area. His name is uh, Dr. Jay Kluski. He's a Ph.D., and, and uh, he's got quite a background. And, I, and, I, and the reason why I contacted uh, Dr. Kluski, and I'll call him Jay to start with because I'm going to make him, make him homegrown. He is homegrown. <laughs> he is homegrown. Jay and Bruce, you know, JB. I mean, that, that's mm -hmm. a heck of a combination piece aspect of it. But anyway, the, the reason why I'm, I've gotten him on here to, to talk about this issue, this is the book he's written, by the way, and uh, he's had other areas that he's, he's written, whatever. But I, I read an article in the, in the Portland Tribune just late, the last, the last article, the last issue, and they highlighted uh, 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 SEI, Tony Hobson, and and boy, you need to get that piece and read that piece. It's a very important piece. And he says, I've got the needle. I've found the needle in the haystack. You know, the fact, that, I mean, when he started talking about the accomplishment that he's doing with these kids through up to the ninth grade to date, they've been all successful. I mean, he's been making records after records after records, m primarily African-American kids, no sagging trousers, I mean, uniforms, which was totally a no if you will, in public school. You can't ask a kid that basically wear a uniform, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in that article, he, a very compassionate individual, and I'm, uh, and I'm feeling uh, comparable to the individual you've seen in New York. You saw, you saw the National News, 60 Minutes and the like, the gentleman up in New York that's basically doing similar kind of thing. But we've got our own local person that's doing it, again, in Tony Hobson at SEI. But then the other thing he makes the point is now it's a holistic approach. He's now going to be taking kids from the ninth grade to the twelfth, to graduation. And it's a toughie. And he's making the point that I'm going to do it. Well, you ask the question, trying to read between the lines, why is he doing this? Why has he been so successful? And again, as part and parcel of this conversation I'm going to be having with Dr. Dr. Clay, or Jay, is <laughs> that we're going to talk about that. We're going to try to get a sense of uh, how it all started, where we are today, and uh, how can we duplicate, if you will, the SEIs, if you will, in our education system. These are all of the concepts that are there for all kids, for that matter, for the formative years, okay? All right, with that, Jay, welcome aboard. Well, thank you, Bruce. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much fantastic. for having me here. You know, just to, just to expedite matters, you, you know, you've given your resumes, your background, this, that, and the other, but just give us a quickie in terms of how you've gotten to be Dr. Dr. Kirchner at this point in time. Doctor, what, okay. Uh, <laughs> give me a little background on I'll, Jay. I'll do the really short background. Real short background on uh, Jay. Born in the Bronx. 
Uh, 19 years old, had my first midlife crisis. I was majoring in music at uh, New Paltz University. Actually, now it's, I think it's a university now. It was a college at the time, okay. uh, state college at New Paltz. Uh, I can't sing worth a darn. My ear is mediocre, <laughs> and my clarinet playing is less than that. So I panicked, and because what am I going to do with a music major when I can't do any of this, any, any, any music? And I heard about a gentleman out here in Portland. His name is Dr. Jim Samuels. And he was doing some uh, applied philosophy business management training. This is back in 1974. So I called him up. Actually, I wrote him a letter. And he said, sure, come on out. And so I came out for the summer in 1974 and stayed. Hmm. Uh, I studied with him. He's still one of my closest friends, great colleague. Uh, so much of what I teach, I learned in those early 70s, 80s with, with him. And uh, after six years of studying with him and waiting tables and doing that young guy thing, I decided it was time to get back to school because uh, I didn't want to wait tables. That wasn't a career choice for me. So I went to Portland State, finished up my uh, uh, bachelor's degree in psychology, it did rather well. Uh, I'm lucky that way. I do well in school. And uh, went back to waiting tables, uh, to which my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Samuels, uh, we'll call him Jim, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> asked me at the time, why don't you go to graduate school? And I said, nah. And he said, all right, you know. And so three months later, he asked again. And every three months, he'd ask, <laughs> why didn't you go to graduate school? And I said, no, nah, I'm not interested. Finally, one time came, two years into this, he goes, how about graduate school? And I said, I don't think so. Still busting tables, though. Still waiting tables. Okay. Right. And doing other things, okay, you know, doing yeah, some business yeah. management okay, stuff and consulting right. and, you know, kind of odd stuff that way. Okay. And uh, this time he asked, why not? And I thought about that and I looked at him and I said, ah, it's too easy. To which he responded, that's the way it should be. Hmm. When you're really good at something, it doesn't seem hard. And I had this epiphany and went to graduate school. So I, long story, got into UCLA and did my graduate work in cognitive psychology at UCLA, ran down to LA for three years from about 86 to about 89 and ran right back up here to Portland. Because wow. you can't, uh, LA wasn't interesting and I was still interested, I love, love Portland. Mm -hmm. uh, this was about 1990 by now and I put together a, uh, a program, a learning skills program for Portland Public Schools. They did not ask for it. I just had this idea that there was a better way. Mm -hmm. So I put this program together and I looked for the only contact I could find, which was a friend of a friend who was a teacher at Lincoln High School. Mm -hmm. And she read my proposal, she thought it was pretty good, and so she suggested I speak to the principal. I said, great. Which talked to what, the proposal? Which talked to uh, inculcating learning skills from a very young age okay. in our children. So when they get to that junior high school age where they're kind of checking out their interests, kind of change mm -hmm. around, you know, they're not as interested in school for a while, their skills are still there. By habit, they know how to study. By habit, they know how to pick up a book. By habit, they know how to like sit in a class, process information, what to do with it. Mm -hmm. uh, I still think it's the only way we're gonna get kids in large masses to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had this proposal. This woman thought it was a great idea, suggested I speak to, with the principal. I met with the principal at Lincoln at the time. I have no memory of what his or her name was. I Who think was it was a Who superintendent at the time, was it? Oh my God. Blanchard, maybe Blanchard? It may have been Blanchard, or... I didn't even know. Okay. It may have been Blanchard. Okay. But the principal thought it was a good idea too, so he said you should speak to the assistant principal. And the assistant principal said, wow, this is a good idea, you should speak to the tennis coach. <laughs> and that's how I got moved. Wow. Uh, the, down the ladder of uh, down the ladder of connections, and I met with a tennis coach whose name was is Mitch Whitehurst, Mitch. who is now Mitch. the athletic director right. at Jefferson High School. school. Right. right, Mitch Whitehurst thought it was a good idea, and he suggested I go meet Tony Hobson and Ray Leary. Oh. So I, great with me. So I went to SEI. This is in nineteen, ooh, the spring of nineteen ninety, I think. Oh, okay. uh, so I got into SEI. Tony asked me, Ray, both of them asked me, hey, you want to try this out? I said, sure. They said, great. So they asked me to put together a leadership program for the, some of their middle school kids for the summer. Mm -hmm. And I did, and Tony and Ray made sure I was, I was accepted, I fit, 
Uh, How'd they do that? How'd they do that? Uh, they just walked around with me. Huh. I mean, just to let people know we're all, he's one of us. Hmm. And Tony would be wherever I went, there would be Tony. Or wherever I went, there would be Ray. Hmm. And the kids got the message that I'm not just some just outside guy. Hmm. I hmm. kind of fit. Hmm. So, uh, but before they allowed me to be with the kids, I had to take a class presented by, at the time, uh, Joy Cross, who soon married Ray Leary. Uh, and that class opened my eyes to the, the importance of relationships uh, and the, imp especially import the, the especially importance of relationship in African-American culture. And it would be Latino culture also. Uh, I did not know. And I learned so much joy, ended up being my primary guide through the community and helping me learn how to interact and how to relate and how to work effectively with parents, kids, teens, everybody. So between Tony and Ray and Joy and the other folks at SEI, Marshall Haskins was a big, you know, a big benefactor of mine there uh, at the time. Uh, I learned how to work with the community. And uh, they provided some, op some interesting opportunities for me to work. And that's kind of how I got started. Uh, eventually, I left, F you know, I left SEI in around 95-ish and put a high school in the Portland House of Emotion hmm. when it was run by Johnny Gage. I did that for two years. Uh, then put a high school in Portland Community College for a minute. Uh, actually, I didn't. I was just the director of the coordinator of the program. Uh, Portland Community College wanted to have a middle college high school and model model it after the one in I want to say Costa Mesa, California. I believe that was the what one. What did that curriculum look like? That the idea it's still around in a form. The idea was there are a number of students who do not fit in the public high school system. Yeah. Uh, they're, some, some of them are too bright, and the system is, doesn't, doesn't uh, engage them well enough. Some of them just don't fit because they just don't fit. Uh, so we're going to put a school together at PCC that allows kids to get their high school diploma and take college classes at the same time. Hmm. So at the end of two years, like if, if a student would start as a, um, a junior, let's say, at the end, by the time they would have been a senior in high school, they would have their two-year college degree. Hmm as well as their high school diploma. And the idea was to have a, a place at Port, in Portland Community College where a group of these students can become a family hmm. and work together and team up and move through this program together. And what, again, what was the prerequisite again for the student getting into that particular program? They want to. That's it? Pretty much. Hmm. <laughs> um, heard about that. You know, they, some of them were referred by yeah. counselors. Okay. Some of them just wanted to do it. Some of them were on the streets, you hmm. know, and, and it saw an opportunity to get back to education in a different format because the, the traditional high school wasn't working for them. Uh, I really believe high school as it's set up now, school itself as it's set up now, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's a fit for maybe half our kids. You know, but there's another half, it's just not the way they learn. Yet we don't have a lot of alternatives. Is this is this going then comparable to what they're trying to institute at Jefferson High School for the first time? Uh, there. It, yeah, yes, but what they're trying, what they're doing at Jeff, is much more advanced. Really? Because what they're doing at Jeff, and this is Tony, and this is SEI, because they understand the role of relationships. They will be successful because of the relationships they have built with the students and with the families. Hmm. Ben Canada in Harlem is successful because of the relationships he and his staff has built with the students the parents and the community at large. Hmm. That's where the, that, they provide very good services, but beyond the services, without those relationships, it is very difficult to get the community engaged. Now you talk about relationship and then we think about Jefferson High School. Yeah. It seems as though SEI is kind of, will be a part and partial oh, of yeah. that particular program because yes. this they're gonna take all the freshmen, right? Yep. And, and they're gonna be part of that process yep. aspect of it. That's my understanding. Okay. I don't know exactly what they're doing. I haven't, okay. I haven't spoke with Tony about it all. I don't know the nuts and bolts of, of the program they're developing there. But I do know for, I showed up in 1990, so it's mm -hmm. been 21 years at least. They do kids. And they do kids very, very, very well. And that's all over the best. I mean, Benson, I mean, all, all of yes. the school, including Jefferson, right? Yes. They were doing middle school, middle, middle kids in this school, yep. right? So in many ways, a lot of those kids that are graduating out of that program. Yep. Are